remember now that to record. So I will start uh, sharing uh, the screen. And uh, then you'll see the PowerPoint presentation that I want to start with. I think it's very important to, to, recall, um, uh, to recall the Bauhaus. And uh, it's an uh, unending source of wonderment. I still think it's one of the most uh, remarkable educational adventures of humankind ever. And I don't know why people are not more uh, reflective uh, on, uh, on its uh, great achievements. Because, you know, the Bauhaus had only, apparently, officially, had only 70 uh, graduates or alumni. And uh, it lasted for f almost 14 years. Now, there are schools that lasted for uh, a much longer time, and they had thousands and thousands of graduates. But the impact of their schools is not as great as the impact of the Bauhaus. So the exceptionalism of, of the Bauhaus is uh, uh, beyond doubt. With such a small number of people and lasting for only at the most 14, 14 years, they, they changed the world. I, I don't think it's too bombastic uh, to say so. Okay, uh, let me begin from the current slide. So, uh, as I said, the Bauhaus uh, uh, lasted, you know, I have a problem with, uh, ah, I have many problems, I don't, anyway. Uh, so it lasted for 14 years, and there were three periods, from 1919 to 1928 uh, was led by Gropius, from 28 to 30 was led by uh, Hans Meyer, and from 30 to 33 by Miss van der Rohe. This, is the, this was the manifesto of the, of the, of the Bauhaus, and uh, it is in German. I do not know German, but I translated, I have a translation in English. And what you see on the left is the, the image that illustrated uh, graphically the ideal of Walter Gropius. And so, uh, and, and that woodcut was done by uh, Lionel Feininger, a very interesting, uh, uh, he was American, but of, uh, with the German uh, ancestry. And uh, uh, there, was, there was no other architect, as I said, at the Bauhaus. Do, does anyone know how to turn? There is a, I see on the screen this uh, little, you know, note, you are screen sharing. How could I remove that thing? Because I want to have a so-called perfect, um, image I don't know either it sits on top right and it's, it's disturbing what you're seeing yeah but I, I cannot uh, remove it I don't know either sorry Dan I don't think it's so, possible. you know it's uh, it's a few centimeters down I mean it's almost in it's unbelievable actually why is it not more discreet you know I don't understand okay I I, I managed to do something Okay, so this is the Gropius Manifesto from 1919. And, um, oh no. okay, <clears throat> please allow me to read it because I think it's a very important document. Again, this thing popped up, it's unbelievable. Excessive automation is not good. So, <clears throat> the, the ultimate aim of all, pardon? I hear, the, I hear a voice. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I turn off the microphone. Okay, thank you. So, the ultimate, again, this thing is popping up. I don't know what to do. It's very disturbing. The ultimate aim of all creative activity is a building. The decoration of building was once the noblest function of fine arts, and fine arts were in, indispensable to great architecture. This is also interesting, you know, that this was supposed to be one of the pioneers, pioneering uh, masters of modern architecture, but he talks about the decoration of buildings. Anyway, we move on. Today, they, are, they exist in complacent isolation, and can only be rescued by the conscious cooperation and collaboration of all craftsmen. 
architects, painters, and sculptors must once again come to know and comprehend the composite character of a building, both as an entity and in terms of its various parts. Then their work will be filled with that true architectonic spirit, which, as so-called salon art, it has lost. The old art schools were unable to produce this unity. And how indeed should have they done so since art cannot be taught? Schools must return to the workshop, the world of the pattern designer and applied artist, consisting only of drawing and painting, must become again a world in which things are built. If the young person who rejoices in creative activity now begins his career as in the older days by learning a craft, then the unproductive artist will no longer be condemned to inadequate artistry, for his skills will be preserved, preserved for the crafts in which he can achieve great things. Architects, painters, sculptors, we must all return to crafts, for there is no such thing as professional art. There is no essential difference between the artist and the craftsman. The artist is an exalted craftsman. By the grace of heaven and in rare moments of inspiration which transcend the will, art may unconsciously blossom from the labor of his hand, but a base in handicraft is essential to every artist. It is there the original source of creativity lies. Let us therefore create a new guild of craftsmen without the class distinctions that raise an arrogant barrier between craftsmen and artists. Let us desire, conceive, and create the new building of the future together. It will combine architecture, sculpture, and painting in a single form and, and will one day rise towards the heavens from the hands of a million workers as the crystalline symbol of a new and coming faith. Now, this is a, an almost mythic, a mystical uh, text. It is certainly emotional. It is certainly exalted. It is certainly, uh, in part at least, uh, medieval in spirit, not modern. Anyway, uh, uh, and, and strangely, it is often ignored. People, the, the many specialists on the Bauhaus, ignored the very beginning. The very be beginning was, had a spiritual side. I mean, come on, Walter Gropius uses the word heavens, and twice, and the last word of the manifesto is faith. Not to speak about the million workers and the crystalline building, right? I mean, th this, is, this is the language of an exalted man and almost, I would say, uh, almost a mystical man. Anyway, uh, we move on. Uh, you see there are various uh, uh, um, uh, logos, so to speak, for the Bauhaus that were created by Oskar Schlemmer, uh, a brilliant uh, uh, artist uh, professor at the Bauhaus. Uh, this was at the very beginning, you can see it's still um, somehow uh, less modern. Then uh, uh, it used the circular, um, uh, the circular form, which was a, in a way a quest for totality, a quest for wholeness. And here you see the curricula. So at the very center was the building, site testing, design, building and engineering science. So this was at the very core. Around this core, there were the materials, clay, stone, wood, metal, textile, color, and glass. Then around, around it, uh, you know, study of materials and tools, study of nature, study of materials, space study, color study, composition study, and study of construction and uh, representation and at, at the outer uh, uh, part of the, of the circle, the basic course and elementary study of form, study of materials in the basic workshop. So, you know, uh, university today or a school of architecture today would consider this um, ideogram or this diagram uh, as being simplistic and, uh, you know, ignoring many things. And it's true, uh, life became, uh, more complicated and more complex, but at bottom, uh, maybe not. At bottom, maybe we are still dealing with the same principles 
So here it is an essence, and then it is a creative, uh, uh, um, original uh, um, diagram of, uh, I imagine, Walter Gropius' thought, thoughts, but maybe it was not just him. He probably consulted himself with the other professors. But who were the other, the, who were the other professors? Interestingly, there were uh, a group of uh, brilliant artists, Kandinsky, Paul Klee, Johannes Sitten, Oskar Schlemmer, uh, uh, no architect. No architect, although this was supposed to be, as even this diagram shows, a school of architecture. Not just architecture, of course, but the aim was the building, and you can see it. It's right in the center. Okay. This picture moves me a lot. I mean, here you have a group of brilliant people, some of the most brilliant of their time in Europe and worldwide, great artists. Some of them I know, uh, almost all of them. This is Moholy Nog, uh, this is Gropius, this is Mar Marcel Breuer in the center, uh, the younger one. This is Vasily Kandinsky, this is Paul Klee. This is Lionel Feininger, this is Quinta, the only woman, and the only one who takes her hat off. Attention, this is not without some significance. She's the only one who is polite. All these men have their hats on. The only one who didn't take, who did take off her hat was the only woman, and she actually didn't have to. Uh, I, 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 I have a great affection for her modesty. And uh, I, I forgot this uh, gentleman house name. Anyway, but here we have, uh, you know, some of the geniuses of art. Paul Klee, who adorned the walls of Miss van der Rohe's um, uh, apartment in, uh, in um, Chicago. And of course, his role was much larger than that. Then Kandinsky, who even wrote a book about the spiritual in art. Then the great designer and architect Marcel Breuer, born in Hungary. A great talent, and uh, and uh, he was the youngest. Then Grocius, the master of the game. Then Moholinogi, who opened the Chicago, uh, the new Bauhaus in Chicago after the Bauhaus left Europe in 1933. There is also August Macke, and uh, I hesitate to <laughs> to name them with a very strong voice, but. This is a historical picture, and it's a beautiful picture. This is uh, um, this is the complex of buildings that uh, Gropius uh, built. In uh, I mean, he was the architect for the for the Bauhaus in Dessau. Initially, the Bauhaus, uh, I mean, it started in Weimar, and then it moved to Dessau. I think in 1926. Now you can see here we have buildings, all right, but we certainly do not have that cooperation between the painters and the sculptors and the builders. Here we have the builders, but we do not see the painter and we do not see the sculptor. Maybe, maybe Gropius realized that uh, his ideal uh, or his desiderata were not possible uh, as we were advancing in the 20th century. And maybe this was his wisdom actually, that he was able to divorce himself from the impetus of his first uh, uh, intuitions. Now, uh, you have seen many posters and uh, you know, uh, the language is resolutely modern. Uh, this is uh, him, Walter Gropius, uh, who died on this day, uh, the 5th of June, of July. I like this quotation from him, only work which is the product of inner compulsion can have spiritual meaning. You see, he still refers to spirit. He still refers to uh, that inner compulsion. And uh, this is, I think, important because these days, very few architects uh, uh, would, would employ the word spiritual, really. Uh, I know Stephen Hall does, but he's uh, not unique, but not too many, not too many architects today. Uh, I don't think you'll hear M. Kolkas using the word spiritual. I doubt it. Uh, uh, and uh, some other stars of the present, they don't use this word. And uh, in a way, I understand why they don't use it. But from another point of view, I, uh, I don't.
anyway, some of the houses. So he built houses in Dessau. Now here is some, another paradox in a way, and maybe a disturbing one. While he, while the school promoting some some kind of uh, dilution or uh, uh, sting of, of, of and uh, and um, uh, uh, yeah, a, a deterioration of the of the barrier between masters and students. So they were kind of together, and sometimes the master was also a student, and the student then became a master. But in terms of housing, there was a clear distinction. The houses of the masters, like here, were very different than the houses. In fact, I don't even know how the students lived. They probably lived in little cells in a, in a dorm, but the masters had opulent villas. So, uh, <laughs> as you can see, total democracy doesn't seem quite possible on this earth. This is an early work done by Gropius before the, uh, the Bauhaus, and it is expressionistic, as you can see, it's a monument for, uh, for the dead. Uh, um, I don't know the particulars of the, the historical event, but it is, a, it is a modern structure, but with an expressionistic uh, uh, allure, if, if nothing else. Now, this is the mystic of the group, and it's not, a, uh, it's not a, uh, without relevance that this brilliant uh, artist was invited to teach at the Bauhaus. And this is Johannes Eaton. Unfortunately, Johannes Eaton was fired after two years, I think. Uh, so he, he, he left the Bauhaus, although he was very, very uh, loved uh, by the students. And he was uh, in an explicit and implicit way the mystic of the group. He even organized Mazda's Nan celebrations uh, there, and you can see even the way he looks like. And, um, an interesting man, but, but it is not an accident that he, was, uh, he lost his job, because Gropius uh, moved increasingly towards some kind of uh, modernization and, in, and, 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 and uh, even became very uh, close to what was called the international style. And this man had different, uh, different aspirations. Some, some color, uh, he taught um, the theory of color at the Bauhaus. Um, this is Feininger, the one who did the, the, the engraving, uh, the woodcut with the Cathedral of Socialists for the manifesto. Uh, he was an older man, but uh, very talented and sensitive, and as I said, the only American at that time at the Bauhaus. This was his uh, contribution to the manifesto, and I'm sure Gropius agreed with it. Now you can see the, 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 the iconic uh, building uh, suggested here is, is far from what modernity uh, strived for or uh, uh, you know longed for uh, it, it's an, it's an, it's, a, it's 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 not a modern uh, modern building at all anyway this is august make i think a sculptor um, yes um, and so he invited no gerhard marx sorry uh, the reason august make but this is Ger Gerhard Marx. Uh, I always have troubles to remember his name and I apologize. So Gerhard Marx, he taught sculpture. Again, it is very interesting that the School of Architecture, or which was supposed to have a deep center architecture, there had only one architect there, and that was Krokus at that time. This is the prince, the Russian prince, Vasily Kandinsky, a brilliant, important, very important uh, abstract uh, uh, artist, and you see a sample of his painting, uh, one of the, the very important modern artists of the 20th century, then uh, the, the poet of uh, painting, uh, of, of the, the poet of painters, the great Paul Klee, who painted very modest paintings, but very, very beautiful, and maybe a book has to be written, or it was already written, comparing him with Picasso. Very different uh, personalities, but uh, uh, I would say that Clay was in no way uh, inferior to Picasso. Uh, maybe you know Renzo Piano built a huge uh, museum for him, 
uh, unfortunately, uh, personally, I think it's a little too big for, for such an intimate and delicate painter as, as Paul Klee. He died at 60. This is a painting by him. Uh, you can find on the web, uh, the, I think the Zin published his uh, notebooks. He was almost like a present day or modern days uh, Leonardo. Extremely interesting uh, notations for his uh, courses at the Bauhaus, uh, crossing frontiers between disciplines. He also loved music and, and, and uh, very intellectual, but not in a dry way. Uh, a, a great mind, Paul Klee. This is Günther Stölzel, uh, the, the teacher of, uh, of textile work, of the textiles workshop. And it's also very, in a way, beautiful. Yes, that uh, Gropius didn't neglect textiles in his school. Uh, there was also another, and, and she, of course she was a student, I think, and then became also a professor of textiles, the wife of Joseph Albers. Amy Albers, I think it was her name. Um, I should know his name. No, no, this is Schlemmer, Oscar Schlemmer. Oscar Schlemmer, who was a, a magician in the field of choreography, and he choreographed uh, great uh, uh, parties and costumes for the uh, party goers at the, at the Bauhaus. What the Bauhaus did brilliantly, and what most schools ignore, they combine work with play. And so there was this feeling of a continuous celebration. And uh, so I, I think the result was great joy and great creativity. You see, this is, if you do something like this today, you would be considered, uh, you know, avant-garde and very modern, but this was done 100 years ago almost. And, and, and uh, for, for the costumes, and the choreography, Oscar Schlemmer uh, was uh, responsible. He also did those logos of the, um, of, the, um, uh, of the Bauhaus. So he was also an excellent, uh, a truly excellent uh, graphic designer. This is Breuer, uh, a brilliant uh, uh, designer and architect, and, and, and he had a, a, a very uh, successful uh, career in the United States. He crossed the ocean with uh, Walter Gropius, and Walter Gropius became the dean of the graduate school uh, design at Harvard. And, and uh, Gropius uh, taught himself, not Gropius, uh, Breuer taught there as, as well, built a few houses with Gropius, and then, then he started his own uh, single career. Uh, a, very, a very good architect and designer. This is a building done in the United States by Marcel Breuer. I have a whole presentation on Marcel Breuer, but I don't know if we'll have the time today to, to show it. This is, uh, this is Laszlo Mokolinog, uh, uh, also a very interesting uh, uh, artist, uh, 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 who his uh, main uh, interest was photography. And he was the director of the Chicago New Bauhaus. So when the Bauhaus dismembered, when, when the Bauhaus uh, disintegrated, some of them flew to the States and, and he opened a new Bauhaus in Chicago. There was another Bauhaus that opened in Ulm in Germany. You see, when something is, so this school, this movement was so nourishing, so it had substance. It was not a superficial experiment. And we talk about it now, 100 years later, since its inception. And it had branches, you know, one in Chicago, one in Ulm, even one in India. There was, a, 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 you know, a, a, an outpost of, 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 of the Bauhaus in India. This is an artwork by uh, Laszlo Mokolinogi, and he, he was really a remarkable artist. And I think he initially he was a lawyer. Interesting. And this is the one and the only Miss van der Rohe, uh, who became the director of the Bauhaus between 1930 and 1933. The school has been accused of uh, having leftist and communist, uh, uh, you know, uh, interests, if not ideals. So uh, there was a conflict between, um, you know, the 
political leaders at that time. The Nazi movement didn't agree with, uh, with the Bauhaus, although some people uh, claim that Mies had some uh, accommodations uh, for the Nazis in his ideology. I don't know. But I do know that uh, the Nazis considered that the school had the left leanings and the communist uh, you know, interests. This was the monument of Rosa Luxemburg, done by, built by, uh, by, by Miss in brick. In a, and there is still some kind of a cubistic expressionism, if I can call it so. And you, you see the work is not uh, politically indifferent at all. Uh, and uh, I like this fact that the Bauhaus was uh, without doubt a school with, uh, with, uh, with uh, intense artistic interests, but also didn't neglect, uh, you know, social interests and politics. In fact, Hans Meyer, the second director, uh, in fact, went too much in the direction of uh, um, the social interests. And uh, he was a declared communist, actually, and he even uh, not, not only sympathized, but uh, built in, 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 uh, in the Soviet Union and had uh, extensive collaboration with, uh, with the Soviets. Uh, this, this was a page from the work by uh, Johannes Sitten. You see, this was, he, he was laughed by the students. Unfortunately, Walter Gropius, it seems, uh, didn't laugh him after a while. Uh, anyway, he did have an impact on the school. And it is very possible that if Eaton didn't leave, the school might have not forgotten its initial impulses. But, but, in, but maybe uh, Gropius had a certain wisdom that he was able to accommodate himself to, to the more modern march of the world and responded to, to it um, uh, accordingly. Schlemmer, again, a brilliant artist, really. I, I, I have to find out when he was born and the day we have to celebrate Schlemmer on, on his own terms. Now, we have to acknowledge it. I, I don't know very well. I mean, I have my own, uh, you know, uh, position vis-a-vis -vis Gropius as an architect. But as a man who had the intuition of the genius of these people, and acted upon those intuitions, he was, he was uh, incredible. I mean, this man brought around him truly brilliant people. Without them, the school would not have been what it was. Here they are, and Slemmer is at the center. Um, you can recognize his uh, haircut, which is very similar to mine. Uh, now, you see again, and and, and he was not Dutch, and he was not, he, he, you know, the book Homo Ludens probably was not written at that time by Johann Heusinko, but you can tell that, that this school understood something that most schools ignore, and that is, there is a, a, an intricate and intimate and intense and very beneficial relationship between play and work. And if you, if you succeed in combining them, something beautiful can happen. And, and you see here, some people are dressed as civilians, some have costumes. This shows the hybrid character of the, of the school and, and this jo joy, which was the result of the fact that, that they both studied seriously, they worked seriously, but they also played intensely. And it was, uh, uh, they, they didn't do so al alternately, they did it simultaneously. And I, 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 uh, I, I entertain this thought uh, lately that maybe uh, the division of the week in working days and, and the weekend is not a good one. And it's not a good one because for most people, those working days have no pleasure in them because there is no playing. So you can hear all the time people saying, I can't wait for the weekend. Why is it that they can't wait for the weekend? Because the work they do is boring. That's why. But if there was pleasure in the work, <clears throat> I don't think they would look for the weekend because they would enjoy the adventure at work, the creativity at work. Anyway, this is a, a, an ample subject, but uh, maybe it's worth uh, thinking about to have a world in which something of the weekend is brought into the working days and something of the working days is brought into the weekend.
uh, okay, uh, this is, uh, I don't know, I think Schlemmer. And look at them, you know, again, you have this, it's beautiful, they are together, they are great individuals, meaning uh, great individualities, and yet they are together. So it's, 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 it's this ideal to have multiplicity in unity. You have both unity and you also have multiplicity and they don't contradict each other. Schlemmer. So Gropius in 18, 1918, a world has been destroyed. We must seek a radical solution. Uh, the final goal of all artistic activity is architecture uh, from the manifesto in 1919. But you see, he was looking for a radical solution. Of course, it was after the First World War, which was devastating. I love this picture, you know. Again, it has to do with exuberance. And Frank Lloyd Wright was totally right. Creativity equals exuberance. And unfortunately, we have so little exuberance in so many schools of the world and in so many societies of the world. And that's because we divorce work from pleasure, from play. That's why. They are not even afraid of the circus. Well, the circus, circus is, is part of life in a way. There is an implicit circus in even at, uh, you know, great uh, assemblies or great political uh, meetings and so on. You know, of course, I am a little bit malicious when I say this, but life does have it. As, as it does have also the beast. As you can see here, there is a, you know, a suggested beast here in the, in the, in the you know, in the center. Now, okay, uh, this is something else and I, I will not continue with the Vienna uh, rebellious Vienna. Now I go to the second uh, presentation having to do with Gropius and that is Hugo Herring and, uh, and Walter Gropius. I want to show you in comparison with Gropius, an architect who actually opposed uh, Le Corbusier at the Siam meetings and in a way, Hugo Herring uh, represented the repressed side of, of uh, Walter Gropius, that side that he uh, uh, moved away from. But I will talk more about Gropius, not about Hugo Herring. I will just mention him, uh, you know, uh, uh, a little bit, because I think it's important to know these architects were actually a little bit less known Hugo Herring is not so well known as, as Walter Gropius is. He, I mean, you know, the, the experts in architecture, of course, do know about him, but he didn't have the impact that Walter Gropius had. Yet, maybe he didn't have that impact exactly because he was a little bit resistant to uh, standardization, resistance to any kind of uh, approaching, you know, what was called uh, later the... Uh, um, you know, the uh, international style and remain true to his uh, organic aspirations and uh, with a mellow kind of expressionism. Uh, okay, so uh, let me go from here. Uh, slideshow from current slide. Okay. I have a book and I could send you gladly. I have it in, uh, uh, you know, PDF format. Uh, I will not read now because I actually don't like to read uh, during a presentation. But you can see the title, The House as an Organic Structure. Uh, this is the man, this is the architect, uh, even his posture is, is, is modest and reflective. There is this big book that you can, you can uh, purchase it if you want. He was truly an excellent uh, uh, architect. I will go very quickly through him because today we, we, we pay homage to, to Gropius. But somehow Hugo Herring is connected a little bit, at least, with, uh, uh, with the meanings uh, hidden or expressed openly in the manifesto by Walter Gropius. He was a very fine architect and, uh, and it's just a shame he's not uh, as, as well known as some others. It is also interesting, as I said, that he opposed, he had the courage to oppose Le Corbusier at an important Siam meeting. 
And uh, it might be that, uh, uh, you know, Florian and Daliana, uh, do, you, do you see here something connecting with your library? Totally. Yeah, yeah of course, it's the Zollinger construction. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, very, it's very obvious. Of course, we have used it a little bit because we didn't do it arching and use it as a reciprocal, uh, reciprocal structural system. But uh, uh, we are very much in love with the, with the way how we put these boards together and the three boards are held by you know, these two screws. So it's a little bit of a, yeah, maybe not or reference to, to this early construction system. I, I find it very uh, interesting. Yes, aesthetically also very pleasing. You know, this wood and machine logic together, this uh, mixture of precision and, and yeah, the, the bolts, the machine within it, sort of the the old traditional uh, material, and then um, Why is this the engineering logic behind it. So uh, you see. The architecture promoted and built by by Hugo Herring is 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 is, is earthy, is organic, is uh, is so different from the houses that Walter Grotius built. Although before the Bauhaus, and you will see a few buildings by Grotius, he was building differently. And in fact, I saw today that there are actually two Walter Grotius. Uh, uh, is the one who still is connected with almost with the arts and crafts movement in a way. And, uh, and then you have the modernistic uh, Gropius who, especially in the United States, became uh, uh, almost uh, totally divorced from what he did before the, uh, before the Bauhaus. Now, this kind of uh, image you cannot get from Walter Gropius. Well, just with bricks and with light, you get uh, uh, you get great architecture, and it, it is uh, it, it is a form of doing architecture that uh, the, the modernists uh, increasingly increasingly became critical of or moved away from. This is the plan of a house. The image, unfortunately, is not a, the greatest resolution, but. Uh, you know, again, as I said, this is a quick reference to an exceptional architect who represented uh, the organic ideal and with some touches of uh, mellow uh, expressionism and even with some touches of uh, spirituality that Gropius, although he did mention the word uh, and uh, the words heavens, he moved away from, especially after he moved to the, to the United States. Uh, please remember this image and then we, we, we arrive at the houses by Gropius, we'll realize what a difference. But again, initially Gropius himself had some kind of, I think, uh, medieval uh, longings. And also in terms of program, this is a farm, it's not an office building, you know, it's a farm. Now this is uh, different, it is a sculpture. Sculptor uh, is not uh, Hugo Herring. I, uh, but there was an expressionism of the time that, that maybe affected the Gropius too and will arrive there. Now on the right is Hugo Herring, on the left is Miss van der Rohe. Uh, Miss van der Rohe who has a nice, nice tantem. Uh, maybe he spent his vacation in some islands. Uh, <laughs> a little bit sarcastic, but uh, anyway. What's going on? Uh, yeah, you see, even in terms of an office tower, Hugo Herring is quite different, both from, and we'll see the participation for the Chicago Tribune Tower of Walter Gropius, so very different from Hugo Herring. Uh, 
this is now a, a tower proposed by Nice for Berlin, a little bit different from uh, the towers he actually built in the United States. Uh, so this is Hugo Herring, this is Miss. Hugo Herring, Miss. Okay, why do I have so many pictures of him? Uh, this is an apartment building in Berlin. Berlin had the great idea which other cities could, uh, could, uh, could inspire themselves from Three times in the 20th century, Berlin invited the best architects or some of the best architects in the world to build uh, uh, apartment buildings, uh, some of them social housing, housings. And uh, it was a brilliant idea because at this moment, Berlin has three zones uh, uh, where you can find uh, great buildings by great architects from three periods, 1930s, 1950s, and 1980s, a great investment to invest good architects, uh, to invest in the work of good architects, and for a for a for a, uh, a purpose that is worthy, and that is to imagine and build houses, affordable houses. Okay. Now, sorry, I uh, I don't know why, why is Kistler here. I prepare this. Uh, uh, Later, I want to arrive at Gropius. Although Kistler himself, of course, uh, I know why he is here, because he represents the other side of modernity, the surrealist, the organic one, but now is not the time to talk about Kistler. Uh, so we arrive at Walter Gropius, and this will be just a, another short introduction, and the last presentation, which will follow in a few minutes, will be dedicated solely to him. Uh, we saw the, the manifesto, we read the manifesto, we saw the, uh, uh, this, we saw the pictures, maybe the, uh, I didn't look, well, this picture well, you didn't yet see of him, he was a handsome man. He was even married once to a remarkable woman who was married to three geniuses. I'm talking about Alma Mahler. So she was married for a few years with Walter Gropius. She was married with a great composer, Gustav Mahler, and she also was married or had a very tumultuous relationship with, with uh, Oscar Kokoska, the great uh, painter. What an incredible woman. <laughs> Obviously, she was special. If these three brilliant men, all four for, fell for her. And we saw this one, uh, the program of the Stadlich Bauhaus in Weimar. I'm not going to read it now. Uh, anyway, what I like about these people, and maybe we, we, we could do something to, to maybe something necessary for our time. There was, a, there was this belief that they could change the world. And, uh, and I wonder, do we have such a belief today? Because I don't see it so much. The stars of today, some of them at least, are kind of shallow, you know? They, they build their star domes, but I don't see really a uh, relevance uh, that, that makes it, I mean, their work is maybe interesting, aesthetically uh, provocative, but something is missing. I don't have the feeling that, that some of the architects today, even some of the best architects today, really want to better the world uh, and not just better their own uh, career or their own uh, uh, stardom, you know. I, I think the modern movement before the Second World War had a, uh, 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 was not divorced from social aspirations. And I think that was a quality that early modernism had. This is a house he built before the, uh, before the, uh, the Bauhaus. Uh, he always worked, apparently he couldn't draw. Walter Gropius couldn't draw. One of the great masters of the 20th century architecture, it is said he couldn't draw, so he always worked with another architect. Here he worked with Adolf Meyer and uh, is, a, is a very interesting uh, villa or house. How different from this one, no? You would say, wait a minute, this cannot be the same architect, but <laughs> it's the same one, it's Walter Gropius. Uh, and here is again Walter Gropius and it is his, his own house in the United States. Uh, okay, we saw this one. 
he makes fun of the specialist. He obviously admires the generalist. Specialists are people who always repeat the same mistakes. But we live at a time obsessed with specialization. As you know, you know, we have so many counter specialists. And uh, it seems Gropius was rather sarcastic towards the specialists. If your contribution has been vital, there will always be somebody to pick up where you left off. And that will be your claim to immortality. <laughs> anyway, I imagine he was thinking of his own immortality. But he's probably right. When uh, a certain action has vitality and meaning, it's possible that uh, it will be continued in, in one form or another. Our only, uh, we saw this one, uh, we saw this one. Uh, I like this quotation from him. Uh, it's amusing. The mind is like an umbrella. It functions best when open. Now many people uh, should know this quotation from Walter Gropius because uh, the mind of many people is not at all like an umbrella, meaning it's not open or doesn't function uh, as an open umbrella does. So you see, the education of one of the masters of the modern movement, educated in private elementary school. In 1903, he left school and went to the Technical uh, University in Munich to study architecture. Although he studied architecture in Berlin and uh, Munich for four years, he received no degree. Gropius could not draw and was dependent on collaborators and partner, partner interpreters throughout his career. In school, an assistant is hired to complete his homework for him. <laughs> in 1904-1905, he served in the military, then went back to school. In 1907, he left school without completion and went back to Berlin because of the death of his brother. Uh, famous quotes, society needs a good image of itself. That is the job of an architect. The mind, is, we read this one, I'm not sure he's right when he said architecture begins where engineering ends. I, 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 I debate that. Specialists are people who we read that the only work we read is the final goal. Uh, we read that as well. So I guess he has about the same um, uh, quotations, uh, you know, that uh, repeat themselves. This is the complex of the Bauhaus buildings in Dessau that he built in 2000, in uh, one, one hundred, one, uh, 1926, when the school moved from Weimar to Dessau. This is a factory he built before the, uh, before the Bauhaus. So he was, I think, 37 when he uh, founded the Bauhaus. This is an apartment building that he built in Germany in 1950-something. Uh, and uh, on the same campus, you can see a building by Alvar Aalto, a building by uh, Oskar Niemeyer, a building by Bakema. Uh, it's a great, great, great uh, uh, site to see early modernistic works in the field of uh, you know, uh, blocks of flats or uh, apartment buildings. Now, this is the Panam building. Well, it was initially called and belonged to Panam, the, the airline, but uh, I think the Panam ran out of business when I mean, it was uh, bankrupt uh, and it doesn't exist any longer. So now it's MetLife. Some people don't like this building, but I don't think it's, uh, it's, a, it's a bad addition to the, the complex and rich uh, skyline of uh, New York. Uh, you can see not far away Chrysler building. Uh, one of the houses he built. He built several houses and some of them in, in collaboration with Marcel Breuer, but we will we'll arrive at them in greater detail. This is his own house in the States. Uh, he was able to build several houses for himself, so I think he was doing approximately well. Here he is with the other master, uh, Le Corbusier. <laughs> Both dropped out, uh, drop, how do you say, drop out from school. I mean, uh, Le Corbusier did, didn't even drop out. He didn't bother to, to start the school of architecture to begin with. 
I sometimes wonder, sometimes really wonder, do we really need schools of architecture, really? I mean, it seems some of the masters, I mean, <laughs> it seems architecture, who is supposed to become an architect will become, doesn't matter what. Anyway, I don't know if you know, but Le Corbusier lost the sight, I think of his right eye at 28. So from 28 onwards, and meaning for other 50 years, Le Corbusier saw with only one eye. And I think the one that, that didn't function was the right eye. I read that strangely he was painting at night and he lost, all of a sudden, he lost the sight uh, uh, in his right eye. It's incredible. I don't know what he did, you know, what kind of a painting. But he remained uh, like Argus, a uh, one eyed uh, being. Uh, and there is a funny picture. Of him uh, on the on the uh, in in the railway station in Brussels in Belgium, together with a young architect who worked for him and one of the great composers of avant-garde music, Yanis Xenakis, they both returned from uh, talking about the pavilion in in Brussels, which was a great 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 building, and it's said 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 that it was demolished. But what is funny about that uh, picture, both of them waiting for the train is that uh, you had two architects who together had two eyes because Yanis Xenakis also lost his one eye in the Second World War. And he worked for uh, Le Corbusier for uh, about 11 years. He was also responsible for La Tourette and a very interesting man, Yanis Xenakis. Anyway, back to, back to Gropius and his own villa, but we'll, we'll, uh, this is just a collage of some images. Uh, Dessau, um, Bauhaus, the Bauhaus in Dessau, the, the, the embassy of the United States in Greece, built by uh, architects cooperative or collaborative, the, the architecture firm that he had in the United States. I don't think his works uh, were so great, really. Uh, some of them are okay, but I, 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 think, uh, I think what he did, even this embassy is a little bit... Uh, too much of a so-called embassy, I think, too regular, too, I don't know. Anyway, this is the factory he built actually with, uh, with uh, Adolf Meyer before the Bauhaus, a beautiful staircase here. Uh, you know, truly very modern, but uh, uh, I don't know, aesthetically it's, it's, uh, it's pleasing and it's, it has a certain complexity, but it's also simple, I like it. And it's a factory, it's not, a, it was built in Köln at the Werkbund in Köln, which unbelievably they had some great buildings there, the glass pavilion by Bruno Taut, and it was uh, van der Welte also built there. It, it lasted only for a few months. It was an exhibition, and because the First World War started in 1914, everything has been demolished great buildings built just for a few months. Now, could we say that this is Homo sapiens? I doubt it. This, is, this was his contribution to the Chicago Tribune competition, a very, you know, uh, so-called modern prismatic building, maybe nothing so special, but uh, it was built before the world. I mean, uh, the competition took place before the world. Uh, I don't know, I mean, we have seen buildings like this. Yeah, I guess these were the clients for the Panam Tower. Hello, Mr. Gropius. Hello, Mr. Gropius. You laugh bow ties. Well, many architects laugh bow, bow ties. Uh, <laughs> it's something unresistible, irresistible about bow ties. Um, and some like even suspenders, like uh, Peter Eisenman. Okay. Now, I love this building. This is an industrial building, uh, and uh, you see it's a, it's a form of architecture that he abandoned later on, but uh, I think it's very seductive. It is modern, but it, it also has a little bit of a uh, touch of expressionism in a way, which I like. Okay, we saw this one, we saw this one, we saw the apartment building, we saw the, this was an amb another embassy, but I don't think it was built. Could it be that it was in Baghdad? 
it's possible. Now we we look at this image uh, again. When I when I said that they were playful, this image shows it. You know, uh, with the students at the Bauhaus. This is beautiful. These people were adults, of course, but there was something of of, of, of a child in all of them, and. And, 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 and I think human beings are their best when the, the inner child uh, uh, manifests itself. And unfortunately, society is very good at, 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 uh, at uh, inhibiting that, that child. And when society doesn't do it, we do it because of fear, because of reticence, because of I don't know what. But Friedrich Nietzsche was right, I think, when he said, and I said this before, and allow me to say it again, he understood, Nietzsche understood correctly that without creativity and without that child, I mean, without that child, we, we, we cannot truly really arrive at creativity. When he said that the human being needs three transformations, first the camel carrying heavy weights, meaning the study, the, the heavy work, the, you know, absorbing the knowledge and going through errors and trials. And so at, begin, at the beginning, you are a camel, and then you want to assert your freedom and you want power and you become a lion, said Nietzsche. But even then you are not happy because you have power, you are the king or the queen of the jungle, but you have no creativity. So he suggested that the last transformation should be from the, from the lion to the child because the child recreates the world and the child asks the questions and has curiosity and he has innocence and ingenuity, and I, I, I believe it's, it is so, and what I see here, I see the students at the Bauhaus being childlike or children-like. Look, even here, you know, they are children, you know, I mean, these structures, they are ludic structures, really. Maybe I idealize them, but this is a drawing by Johannes Eaton that perplexed me. It's called the House of the White Man, and I wonder if he was not sarcastic. Because, after all, what's so great about the wife of the, high, the white man as he depicts it, you know? I think he was sarcastic. I don't know. Um, again, playing. <laughs> okay, playing. Play, play, because you were great school. And I'm sure you learned greatly. You studied greatly because you were free, you were playful, you enjoy yourselves. Uh, Bauhaus, Bauhaus, Archive. We, we, we read this in the manifesto. Uh, now look, on the other hand, what Philip Johnson said, architects are pretty much high class whores. We can turn down projects the way they can turn down some clients, but we both go to say yes to someone if we want to stay in business. I don't know, this is Philip Johnson. But we'll talk about uh, I don't know why. I have some quotations from various architects here about architecture, but uh, I don't know uh, if we should read them now. But I do like this one by Johnson. I hate vacations. If you can build buildings, why sit on the beach? <laughs> well, Mr. Johnson, not everybody has uh, your connections. Not everybody receives uh, commissions to build uh, buildings or skyscrapers. So I guess we have to sit on the beach sometimes. And this is Hermann Herzberger and about Hermann Herzberger we'll talk tomorrow, meaning Alexandra Krivitz, an architect from London. Uh, she will uh, make a presentation on Hermann Herzberger tomorrow. And I will make one about another great Dutch architect, Tudok. Uh, so tomorrow we'll have the chance to, 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 to contemplate, to see the works of two very important Dutch architects. The Dutch continue, continue to amaze me with, uh, with how many great architects they had and have. And he's right. If you think you can't make the world a better place with your work, at least make sure you don't make it worse. Correct. Anyway, we saw this, this we saw it. Ah. I'm glad I, I have here because I can talk a little bit about Hans Meyer, who followed Gropius as the director of the Bauhaus, but he was dismissed after two years because I think he was a little bit too much of a social worker. I think it is good for an architect to be a social worker, but not too much. He was, 
and uh, even the way he wrote, but he was an interesting man. And I'm not reading this, but I can send you these uh, manifestos. I have a beautiful book called Programs and Manifestos in Modern Architecture. And I have it in uh, PDF format. So whoever, if some of you wants it, uh, I will uh, gladly uh, send it to you tonight. Uh, this is Hans Meyer. Uh, hello, Mr. Meyer. He built uh, buildings, you know, in a way without glory, but there is a certain hidden glory in his uh, uh, reticence, aesthetical reticence, lack of flamboyance. There is a certain, because I think even minimalists could have some kind of, uh, you could be excessive in my minimalism as well. I know I am expressing myself in an oxymoronic way, but when you are excessively minimalistic, yes, you are excessive. Uh, he is not excessively uh, minimalist, but uh, he, there is an architecture that, that you know, is, it, you can tell it, it, it's almost dry, almost dry. Uh, it's very rational, it's very subdued, uh, but it is a good, it, I think it is a good architecture and I, he was an interesting man. Okay, and now quickly, because uh, time is running, well, we still have a little bit of time. I will talk to you about the, the only woman at the Bauhaus, and it is a pleasure for me. Unfortunately, she deserves more. I have a, I started a presentation on her, but it deserves to be developed. She was the only professor or master at the Bauhaus, and I'm happy she was there because I think uh, uh, it is important to have women in uh, responsible positions and I hope they will uh, gain such positions more and more. And by the way, I read that the countries that were led by women did better with the pandemic than the countries led by men. I don't know, but I read this. And the first example was New Zealand. Homage to Gunther Stelzel. Uh, I'm not very sure I pronounce the name properly, but I tried. She was without doubt a, a brilliant woman. And uh, she, I will never forget, Gunta, that you took your hat off, surrounded by men who didn't take their hats off. Okay, she was a creator. She was an artist and a brilliant, uh, she, uh, here she is in all her older age, working with the uh, weaving, with the textiles. And she did some very fine works. In fact, Gropius had in his office uh, a tapestry by her uh, and uh, looked great. In fact, I think without that tapestry, his office would have looked, uh, looked uh, less, uh, less warm. Tapestries bring warmth, of course, to, to, to any environment. And after this, just as a, some kind of a parenthesis, you will see some tapestries done by Le Corbusier, brilliant tapestries. We neglect this, that he also did great tapestries and you'll see some of them after we, uh, we look a little bit at the works of Gunther Sturzel. Yes, she was modern, of course, abstract, but there is a warmth here also because of the material. But not just because of the material, also the way the compositions are. She was very, very good. There she is between Marcel Breuer on the left and Oscar Schlemann, who finally took his head off uh, on, uh, well, on her right is Marcel Breuer, but in the picture on the left and on the other side is uh, Oscar Schlemmer. Then with the eyeglasses, uh, Kandinsky, then standing up is Gropius. And that's about it that I can recognize. She looks happy. And of course she had reasons to be happy with, the, with the, such brilliant colleagues who probably respected her and valued her. Bravo to her. Okay, so you see, this is the office of the master, uh, Walter Gropius. Maybe she did even the rug, I don't know. A nice tall uh, office. <laughs> okay, so now you'll see some tapestries by, by Le Corbusier. 
And, and unfortunately, when we think of Le Corbusier, we neglect that he also did uh, painting and sculpture, and even more that he did tapestries, and some are brilliant. I mean, brilliant, <laughs> also with brilliant colors, using brilliant colors. Uh, there are books published with his tapestries. Uh, well, I know that Kenneth Frampton uh, thought that this was a, a positive thing that, that Le Corbusier kind of divorced. He, he did occupy himself with painting, with tapestry, with sculpture, but they were not truly integrated in, in, in his buildings. They were almost used as accents or uh, uh, almost some kind of uh, or details or some kind of afterthoughts. So in a way, although he was an artist as well, he didn't bring together the artist and the architect in a conjunction of the kind suggested by Gropius in his manifesto. Maybe, maybe this is the strategy that is correct for modernity. I don't know. That's why I said that manifesto to me was rather medieval in its uh, longings and aspirations than, than, uh, uh, than modern. Now, of course it looks great, but when you look at it, the building has almost nothing to do with the tapestry and the tapestry has nothing to do with the building. The building is white and uh, it's, uh, you know, uh, uses straight lines. And, 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 and the painting or the tapestry is, uh, is, uh, is almost, uh, it's almost done by someone else. You could have said, well, this, here are, we have two people, the architect and the artist. It happened that in this case, the architect and the artist were the same person. But somehow you would say a split personality. Now, um, uh, he drew very well. I mean, he was an artist through and through, no doubt. And he needed painting, you know, he needed to paint. Mr. L.C. You see a book uh, with his tapestry. Uh, an exhibition in a, in a church. In a, yeah, in a church of a castle. Le Corbusier, Oeuvre Tisse. Uh, so there are books just about his tapestries. Okay, and now we arrive at the last presentation, which is uh, dedicated uh, in a detailed way uh, to Walter Gropius. In a way, this is the, the culmination, so to speak, if the word is not too empathic, of our meeting today. And we wanted to arrive here, and we finally arrived at, uh, uh, here. So he lived for 86 years. He died in 1969 uh, on the 5th of July. So he died 51, exactly 51 years ago. We saw already some pictures. This is one of his wives. I don't think he had too many wives, probably two wives, but this is not Alma Mahler, uh, the, the, that lady who was admired by uh, great artists. Here he is near his building in, in Berlin. He's older in the 50s, so he's, uh, you know, uh, around 70, he almost. A young, handsome man. <laughs> drop out from school, Mr. Gropius, why did you do it? You could have uh, had a you know, more predictable path in life. But you were, I guess, a player also, you know. You know that Le Corbusier said that uh, Les Alpinis, the rugby men, uh, he mentioned a few others. Uh, no, I have to translate from French. Are not players. They are the fumists. They are in a way like uh, farceurs, or I don't know if there is such a word in English. I'm beginning to, to be uh, less confident uh, about my English. He was critical of, of, of the sportsmen and uh, the alpinists. He thought that they were not playing. But I wonder what he meant by playing or players. Maybe he meant that a true player is that homo ludens, <laughs> homo ludens who plays creatively. In other words, create something, not just a spectacle, but 
you know, an artwork, a book, a sonata or whatever. I don't know. Here is the architect and his tower for the Chicago Tribune, which he didn't win. He didn't win the, comp the competition. The competition won was won by an American, Raymond Hood, who built a Gothic, a neo-Gothic building. <laughs> you see, the new world, the brave new world that Aldous Huxley wrote about, chose a neo-Gothic building. Didn't choose the modern building, the brave new world building that uh, Gropius envisioned. You can even say he's kind of sad. He probably knew at that time that he didn't win and he's melancholy and sad. It's okay, Mr. Gropius. Uh, <laughs> life is tough. I like this picture. You can, it's almost like it reminds me of uh, uh, a scene in Persona by uh, Ingmar Bergman where he superimposed uh, two halves of two people and created a face out of two people. Here you almost have a feeling that, and I actually think because I, yesterday when I was preparing this material, I even uh, named one of my messages homage, homage to Gropius 01 and Gropius 02. I actually think he had a duality in him and is shown in his works until, uh, until the Bauhaus and after the Bauhaus. And this face, this face, I kind of see two people, unless I am totally uh, wrong. But uh, anyway, not so much here. But I like him. He's uh, clearly, I mean, can you imagine? We are, we are dealing here with one of the major architects of the 20th century who had as employees, so to speak, people like Kandinsky or Paul Klee or Oskar Schlemmer or Lionel Feininger or Johannes Eaton. So he was, he was spoiled with incredible, uh, you know, uh, proximities, you know, with great artists around him. And he deserved them, of course. Bravo, Mr. Gropius. Now drawings <laughs> by him. I, 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 I read here that he didn't draw. Uh, so that's why he, he always worked with another architect. Uh, now, we don't know if this was done by his hand or someone working with him. <laughs> but even so, it seems a little bit elementary and uh, you know, hesitant in a way. Competition entry for the Paris of the Soviets <clears throat> in Moscow in 1931. Of course, all these architects uh, participated in such competitions. Uh, Le Corbusier as well. Le Corbusier participated here participated for the, uh, um, the organization of the, the United Nations in, in New York and participated for the, uh, uh, for the building in, uh, in Geneva, in, in Switzerland. And he, he lost all three of them. Uh, in some cases, like uh, in, in New York, I think he lost, or in Switzerland, in Switzerland he lost because he didn't use the right ink, the prescribed ink uh, for rendering his drawings. In uh, New York, he probably felt he was robbed uh, because his ideas have been uh, recycled and used by uh, Harrison and Abramovich and, uh, you know, mingled with ideas from Oscar Niemeyer. Anyway, there, there were other architects involved. And in Russia, in Soviet Union, uh, 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 the, the chosen project that the people chose was uh, some kind of um, classicist melodrama. Again, isn't it paradoxical that here you have the Soviet Union you now building the new, generating the new man, you know, the gloriously new, fresh uh, 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 human being, but they actually chose for their palace, the palace of the Soviets, a, a, a classicist building with nothing new certainly not fresh, certainly not revolutionary. And exactly the same mistake did the Americans. The capitalists in, in Chicago chose uh, a building that was neo-Gothic. <laughs> so, so there you have it, you know, both capitalism and communism rejected the new actually. And it showed that at bottom they actually conformists. And this is something really worth uh, talking about and thinking about and exploring. These societies that claim some kind of uh, uh, 
uh, you know, uh, exceptionalism. Uh, at bottom, they're actually banal. Uh, anyway, I will stop here about this, but it is a very interesting subject to me. So that there were great modern architects who wanted to contribute to with, with fresh new architecture to the palace of the Soviets, but the Soviets, the people, you know, with, with quotation marks, rejected them. Of course they rejected them because they didn't understand that language. They understood only the Doric white columns. That's all they understood. Now this is the house, a study for a house. I don't know who did the drawing, but it seems quite uh, delicate and uh, refined. Uh, this one we saw, this is, this is the, his project for Moscow. And of course, artists in general are naive politically. Le Corbusier was naive. Uh, 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 Gropius was naive. Uh, uh, they proposed some, uh, you know, buildings in a modernist, uh, uh, you know, uh, with a modernist aesthetics, but the Soviets wouldn't have it. They wanted to see Greek columns, and that's what they chose, and that's what they built. Uh, this is a project from 1927, so, so he was close to being fired by the students at the Bauhaus. He left the Bauhaus in 1928, so he, he did this project for a total theater, which is a famous project by Gropius. It was not built, but uh, had some interesting ideas. Again, I don't know who did the, the drawing. The Fagus factory, which I mentioned, and is a very fine work and was done eight, nine years before the uh, founding of, of the Bauhaus. And I think he worked with Adolf Meyer. Um, it is a very fine work. And I actually think these works that he did before uh, founding the Bauhaus were superior to those did uh, in the United States, those built in the United States. Because he, he was still in, uh, imbued in the traditions and history of Europe. He used brick in a convincing way. He, he also had uh, ample uh, um, modernist uh, surfaces, like with glass. So it's both, it's a building that is both modern, but also has something else. You see the building on the right it uses the same brick. Now I don't, I imagine the building on the right was existent and Anyway, I, I think this period in his creativity was uh, a little bit better than, than what he became famous in the States. And uh, these windows are done very well. Um, I mean, I, I, one could admire them even in this picture and seen from the inside. Nineteen fourteen, uh, I mentioned the Verbund exhibition, which lasted for a few months. Hello, Mr. Uh, Homo sapiens. So you work hard, you invite great architects, and you destroy their works in a few months. This is true wisdom, indeed. And it wasn't just Gropius here; it was Bruno Taut of uh, Van der Velde and uh, others. Very sad, but it's a great building by Gropius here. How could they destroy something like this? is beyond me. So this is from 1914. So five years, he was um, 32 years old, five years before founding uh, um, Bauhaus. The monument to the uh, March uh, dead, or dead of March, the March dead, uh, with Alfred Forbat from 1920-1922. He already became um, the Bauhaus. And this I consider, uh, you know, at least in part, uh, it is modernistic, but it has a touch of expressionism. It's a, it's a good, uh, it's a good, uh, I can call it structure building. Uh, it's not really a building, it's rather a sculpture. It's a monument, but it's, it's not bad. Uh, you might even say it has some touch of futurism in it, you know. A house from 1921, designed for Adolf Sommerfeld in Germany, 
This is the one that you saw before, and I hope I have here images of details inside this. It's an interesting house. Um, and it, it is immersed in a way. It has a connection with the traditions of the place, with the German uh, architecture of uh, the early past, at least. But you can tell this is a very different uh, uh, Gropius than the one uh, who built. He built also a little bit in England after he left Germany and in the United States. Here you see a relationship with Lionel Feininger, even with Paul Klee. Um, so this was from 1921. Well, uh, the Bauhaus had already at least two years. And you can tell that here there is something that later he abandoned, the collaboration between the artist and the architect. And the interior is, is medieval in spirit. You know, it's it's uh, this is not a modern building. I look at the so here he was he was still somehow respecting his own words and his own thoughts and his own intuitions expressed in the Bauhaus manifesto. But this was abandoned, and maybe his success was also a result of the fact that he abandoned this path, but maybe also his failure to an extent. I don't know, it, 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 it's worthy of, of asking the question. Now, in 1922, he took part in the Chicago Tribune Tower, and can you imagine, so he did this house, right? And then, this was from 1921, and one year later, something happened to Gropius between 1921 and 1922. And then in 1922, so just one year later, he does this. Can you believe it? That's why I'm saying here we have, a, you know, a modern um, psychoanalysis. I, I would, would probably call this case uh, bipolar personality. I mean, how could you... How could you do something like this? And then one year later, maybe even less than one year later, you do this. I am joking a little bit, but not totally. Uh, the, 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 the difference is dramatic. <laughs> Funnily, maybe if you, if you would have kept the aesthetics and the spirit of that house that we showed before this one, maybe he would have won. <laughs> Or maybe he was an opportunist. He knew he would propose it for Chicago, for the new world. So he proposed a new tower, but he didn't win it because the, because the, the new world wanted new old architecture, not new architecture. I hope I have an image here with a building that won and was built. Yes, the one on the left was built. You see? So the modernistic ones, of, of the four ones on the right, the one by Gropius is the most prismatic and, uh, you know, uh, cleaned up, so to speak. Well, the one, the, the last one on the right too, but they didn't win. The one that, that won is, was the one on the left. Yes, here again, the one on the left. So I don't know who did the second one, but Raymond Hood did the, the one on the left and was built like this with buttresses, you know, like a Gothic cathedral. Then the third one, of course, is uh, Adolf Loss with his intriguing uh, column that su supports nothing uh, except the sky and then Gropius on the right. Hello, Mr. Gropius. We commented already on, uh, on your serious uh, <laughs> melancholia near your tower. Then the, uh, the house is for senior staff. I didn't know though actually they, he built until 1932. So the house is for the senior staff who are quite uh, um, you know, generous, but these are not, this is the school. But you see, gone is the marriage between the painter and the sculptor and the architect. No collaboration. Here you have just the architect. The collaboration might have taken place inside the studios 
in education, but not in the expression of the buildings. It's a fine building, of course, but it's just that, a building. It's just an architecture, if I can say so. Painting a sculpture is not to be, uh, are not to be seen. I regret and I don't know if I have here pictures with a, a building in Weimar where the Bauhaus was until 1926, so for seven years, which was built actually by uh, Van der Belter, the Dutch architect of Belgium. Now, some houses, we saw already some images, you know, uh, again, very different from that house from 1921. They are white, they are large, and there is a certain dynamic, uh, the dynamics of the space. Uh, but the, the architectural language is, 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 is removed from any kind of nostalgia, so connection with, with, uh, with history or the past. And maybe based on such houses, he's considered a pioneering uh, uh, master uh, of modernist architecture. The Gropius house, he built here, he built also uh, in England. I don't know if he built for himself, but in the United States he did. This house still exists. Uh, this one for Mukesh Lemmer. So uh, my, uh, my artist of choice, Lemmer, lived here. They are very large houses. Yes, two masters lived here, but uh, I don't know where they had the funds from. They were doing well, obviously. The one for Kandinsky and Claire. There is a picture of Kandinsky and Claire imitating, in a way, uh, the pair, uh, Goethe and Schiller. Uh, I don't know if I have this picture here. They moved me very much, Kandinsky and Klee together, and they were good friends and great painters. And, uh, I wish I was with them when they were talking about art, when they were just walking through the forests of Dessau. Uh, housing estate, he built also a housing estate, but it's not for the students, this is for, you know, people from, from Dessau, and they still exist. So this, this, this part of, of, of what an architect was supposed to do, I like. In other words, yes, that there was a high interest in art, but the, there were also social concerns, and they didn't neglect these social concerns, especially in their works in, in, uh, in Europe. In the United States, it would have been more difficult. Now, the Bauhaus was, uh, was, uh, came to an end, so they flew. And uh, initially, they found refuge in England. So he built with Edwin Maxwell Fry uh, Village College in, uh, in 1936. It wasn't very clear to me what, what uh, actually Gropius did. I tried to I, I imagine this, this building, but there were other buildings there on the campus, so it's not very clear to me what, what he or them, what, what they did. Well, when you look at the plan, we realize that, yes, it's, it's, it's this, uh, this building. Well, he was established already, you know, he, he, uh, he was a 50 years old uh, architect who was already famous because he founded uh, uh, the Bauhaus. And uh, so he received commissions immediately after he arrived in England. A house, uh, also in England, or several houses uh, here, so I was a little bit confused, but I, maybe the, this whole uh, complex of buildings was done by him in association with that British architect who himself is, uh, has a certain importance, uh, Mr. Fry. And now they cross the ocean and they build a Gropius house in Lincoln, Massachusetts. So Gropius became the director, the dean of the School of Design at Harvard. And he was for about 15 years, I think, 
in that position. And uh, I think he was helped by Marcel Breuer to build this house. Or there is another house of that one, I'm absolutely sure. I don't know about this one, but considering that he never worked alone, <laughs> Mr. Gropius, it's possible that, um, if not Gropius, someone else uh, helped him with this house as well. It's a fine house, and I, I, I like especially the, the entrance with this uh, canopy that uh, is uh, a little bit uh, removed from the main facade and at an, uh, at an angle. A slight discreet touch of expressionism, you know, modernistic expressionism, so to speak. Otherwise, the language is resolutely modern, almost in an austere way. It must have been nice to sit on that armchair, you know, near that uh, glass wall and contemplate the nature and then go to work to, to lead uh, such a school as the Harvard Graduate School of Design. Not bad. Not too many reasons for despair or pessimism. And probably there were some great books in that library. Uh, anyway, life can also be good. <laughs> And for some people, it is. Now, this is how this house is now. I don't know exactly how it was um, 80 years ago or so, but uh, maybe not very different. In uh, Pennsylvania, this one he built with Marcel Breuer, and uh, it's, it's, it's a good house. I think Breuer uh, was more than a draftsperson for him. He, because Breuer had a vigorous uh, temperament, so to speak, in architecture, and I think uh, his contribution was, there is a staircase here, which is very, very remarkable. Look at it. You know, and uh, Frampton loves this building. Uh, and his assistant uh, at that time, Barry Bergdahl, who is now the uh, curator of architecture, the Museum of Modern Art, and is a professor of art at uh, Columbia University. It's true, this, uh, this staircase is very nice, and it, uh, uh, I don't know, it, it, it surprises you. It's, 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 uh, it's modern, but it, it has some. Um, um, it has something uh, unique and uh, it's cultural, but not excessively. It's a fine work. And it's possible that uh, Marcel Breuer had a hand here. And you can see the, the construction of the stair uh, is not uh, without interest, you know. The, it's a good work. Because a, 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 a stair is always an event architecturally in a building. And here, uh, the eventfulness of the stair is, uh, is uh, discreetly enhanced, so to speak, uh, through a little more sculpturalness, if I can say so, through the materials. The forms are uh, interesting. So I think they, they did what they had to do. And even the house, the, 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 the stair uh, outside itself, I hope to have another image, is very interesting. Yes, it is an event in the, uh, in the organism named house. Uh, named house uh, this stair is an event. And it is supposed to be an event. And even the dog seems to like it. I mean, even it, it turns its back on it, but uh, it is said, I read somewhere that where a dog likes to sleep, it, there is home. A dog feels where a home is. It's there where a dog likes to sleep. Yeah, I, I love that stare on the right, but I, I don't know if I have here a picture of that stare. Yeah, here it is. Well, with some snow on it, but it's 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 very well done. 
because there is also the intervention of the capriciousness of that uh, uh, closure, half enclosure. I don't know how to describe it. It's a parapet, but it's it has a certain capriciousness which which has to do with uh, aesthetics and and it's very well done. After all, why do parapets have to be identical on both sides of the stair? Well, at least Gropius and Breuer didn't go so far as uh, Le Corbusier did in India, where he just used, uh, uh, in Ahmedabad actually, uh, as a stair that is uh, dangerous because exactly on the, on the side where there is the, 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 the abyss, so to speak, uh, there is no parapet. There is, on the other hand, there is a parapet near the wall where it didn't have to be. And there is a picture with Le Corbusier uh, stepping up, uh, walking up that stair with a doshi behind him and another uh, Indian architect. And I had a feeling that doshi and the other architect were ready to protect the master because the master also looked, I don't have that picture here, unfortunately, but it's an amusing picture because Le Corbusier was afraid, it seemed in that picture, of his own creation, not to fall on the side of the stair because there was no parapet. <laughs> anyway, the Harvard Graduate Center from 1949-1950 in Cambridge, this was his office. That's how it was called, Architects Collaborative. Uh, I'm a little bit, uh, I mean, I'm not a linguist, but I don't, I'm not very sure here the wording is correct because collaborative, uh, it should have been collaboration, not the architect's collaboration or cooperation, not collaborative or cooperative, but not collaborative. Collaborative, I think is an adjective, not a subjective, a subject, and not a noun. But maybe I'm wrong, I don't know, but it doesn't sound right, quite right to me. But then I'm not uh, really American or uh, English, so maybe. But no, no, I, I, I have a certain sense for language. Um, anyway, it doesn't matter. That was his office, Architects Collaborative. Um, yeah, modern architecture. I actually do not think his, uh, his work in the United States is, is, uh, is sublime. It is fine, it is correct, it is interesting at the most, but we have seen so many, uh, you know, good buildings that were not done by, by famous architects. So, I don't know. But this was done by Gropius. And at Harvard, you know, of all places, I mean, uh, the setting is itself exceptional because the school is exceptional. The University of Baghdad from 1957, 1960—the uh, project for a mosque, which is a little bit burlesque, I think, if I can use such a word, um, or at least the rendering is a little bit—I um, don't know. <laughs> For my taste, it's a little bit funny, but uh, it was built. It looks a little better in, uh, as, a, as a built building, but uh, still, I don't know. Is it truly great architecture? I don't know. Uh, anyway. I actually think Gropius became a little uh, bit uh, self-complacent, uh, less radical, less, I personally regret that he left that uh, phase in his uh, professional life until 1921, 1922. Uh, there was a richness there, and there was also the connection with the traditions of his own country and his own culture, his own history. And uh, I understand this, for example, was done for Baghdad, but anyway, the main gate, University of Baghdad, uh, Gropius plus his office, Architects uh, Collaborative. Now, I, which became, I think here, I think the Architects Collaborative at one moment, he probably retired and, and uh, became this TAC, T-A-C, which might still exist actually. But this was already when uh, he was approaching 80, Gropius. 
this is the, the, the building. Uh, so it's the main gate to the University of Baghdad. Uh, I don't know about this arch, you know, yes, it is broken at the top, but it's still static. Anyway. He uses the same, you see at the top of the building, uh, this uh, arch that, that is a little bit, uh, almost a sign of uh, some kind of classical or classicist longings. Um, a little too convenient, I think. I, I, this is my feeling, but... Uh, now the, the F. Kennedy, uh, John F. Kennedy Federal Office building in Boston from 1963. So he was already eight years old. Uh, it's, it's not bad, I mean, but there are many other buildings that are by lesser known architects that are not uh, inferior to these in the States and in other parts as well. But you wonder, when you look at these buildings, what happened to the man who wrote that manifesto in 1919? Maybe he was wise enough, lucid enough, to realize that that ideal for him then couldn't be followed through. And so he adapted himself to a modernity that came, uh, uh, you know, not ferociously, but with a great vitality and intensity and energy over the world, including his own world. Now, a junior high school, this was from uh, earlier 1948. Uh, it's not very clear to me again what he did here. Uh, but I mean, here I see some postmodern post mo post uh, elements that I don't think belong to him. I, I, I like to think they, they don't belong to him. Um, this, these are lesser known works and I, I, they surprised me when I uh, discovered them. And I, anyway, uh, this is a house in Provincetown in Massachusetts by his architecture office. Um, a modern house, less, less spectacular than the one he did with Marcel Breuer. Then the Panam building that we already saw, uh, now the MetLife building in New York. He worked with Pietro Beluski and project architects Emery Roth and Sons, the important um, you know, uh, architecture offices in New York. Um, so for five years, they were, they were working for this building and it was built and uh, some people uh, dislike it, but I, I don't know. Uh, it still has personality and is, is different from, from many other tall buildings. Now, we arrive at that apartment building, uh, that block of flats that he built in 1957 in Berlin. And I, I truly suggest to you, if you arrive in Berlin, if the pandemic ends and we can uh, travel again, to, to visit these Interbau uh, apartment blocks, uh, because there are great buildings that I mentioned already, one by Alvaralto, one by uh, Oscar Niemeyer, one by Bakema, and there are others. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a pleasure to see in, pro in close proximity great buildings. But this was done by Walter Gropius. Uh, at least here we have some color and uh, move the, you know, the dynamics of, of, of the curved lines. This is how it looks from the back with the staircases and the plans. Uh, 
No, he did a Templar, so in Baltimore, he was uh, 73 years old. I personally, personally don't have uh, great enthusiasm about uh, using these, these arches, you know, these... Um, I, I find find them a little bit too static and uh, placidly so. And uh, even if I can say something like this in, in relation with the temple, a little conveniently bourgeois. And uh, the, the, this architectural classicism, even though with the appearance of modernity, uh, it doesn't show to me you know, great emotion. It shows to me more like dogma. Yeah, I mean, with all due respect, but, you know, such a building, if it was built in, uh, I don't know, in another country by an un unknown architect would have, would have not, would not have, would, it would not have received uh, much attention, I'm sure. Although this facade is, uh, you know, has a certain, but that is still static and I don't know. Anyway, it changed a little bit. You know, everything changes in life, I guess. But I wonder, you know, I mean, this is the man who worked with Kandinsky and Klee and uh, Eaton and Schlemmer. And what happened to that uh, revolutionizing side? You know, uh, but then also a painter like Giorgio de Chirico, you know, after he was uh, painting, uh, you know, metaphysical paintings and surrealist paintings, he returned to some kind of neoclassical uh, painting and so did André Derain. So there are artists who, I guess, at one point uh, they, they get tired of being too freshly revolutionizing and they become a little bit conventional. And it's known actually that many revolutions end up in conformity in the end. I don't want to end now this presentation in a kind of pessimistic tone, but uh, yeah, this is another uh, uh, large uh, housing complex in Berlin. At least Le Corbusier, by the way, of what I just said, kept his uh, revolution, uh, revolutionizing side uh, and, and ethos to the very end. He moved in like a Robinson Crusoe in his Le Cabanon, 16 square meters, uh, and uh, designed Chandigarh. And so this was, I, I think, uh, uh, I don't know, my preference goes towards an architect who remains a pioneer and an adventurer and forces new frontiers and searches and questions to the very end. But some artists can do it, some, uh, some cannot. I don't know, uh, it remains to be seen. Still, some buildings, uh, you know, uh, I mean, the, the apartment building that we just saw from 1957 in Berlin has some merit. Maybe even this one, although, you know, maybe it's not so unique, but uh, it's an apartment building. Then 1961, the award-winning Wayland High School, uh, but it was demolished in 2012. Again, welcome to Homo sapiens, you know, we demolish and demolish and demolish, you know. We demolish John Johansson, we demolish Walter Gropius. It doesn't matter who makes them, you know. We demolish them. Why? Because we can, because we have bulldozers and because people with money want to build a parking lot. So, look, look, human enlightenment. Maybe it was not a masterpiece, but why destroy it? It was certainly not the worst building on the face of the earth. Then the embassy in Athens, which you saw some pictures of, so he was again uh, 73, 74 years old, um, with a consulting uh, Greek architect. Yes, it's an embassy, all right. I mean, you know, it's so obviously an embassy. You know, or if it's not an embassy, it's certainly a governmental building. You know, it's so different from the parliament building Edinburgh by Mirais and Talia Bue. Why do government buildings need to be 
to, to, to base their aesthetics on, on uh, regularity and read, to give the illusion <clears throat> that everything is in order, that everything is under control. Uh, I don't think this is really needed, but... Uh, so it is this conventional side, maybe he, he couldn't do otherwise in this case, but uh, this makes me think with some sadness about the projects that he himself lost in uh, Soviet Union and Le Corbusier lost also in Soviet Union and Switzerland and uh, New York, where you have very creative, had very creative architects lose commissions because they show a creativity that is a little bit unconventional. And, but all creativity has to be at least to an extent unconventional. At least this is my belief. Anyway, this is the embassy in Athens. It's a correct building, but is it enough for a building to be correct? I don't know. I personally don't think so. Now here I am confused, I have to tell you. I do not know, I found this information that he did a glass cathedral. I think he, I'm not truly an expert in, in, uh, in Walter Gropius, but I would be very curious to, to make sure that indeed he did this. It was a factory, which I think he transformed into a cathedral. And it is a, it is in a way uh, uh, surprising and uh, even impressive, but I don't think he did the structure. He just transformed it to, into a cathedral. I'm confused about this. This is why please be kind and, and, and be, be, be uh, uh, considerate with me in the sense that I do not know and I, I, I plan to, to search more. I couldn't find out until today what exactly his role here was. But the building, especially after seeing that um, conformist uh, embassy in Athens, has at least some this brutalist uh, ethos that uh, to me looks a little bit uh, refreshing, so to speak. I don't think he did the building. <laughs> doesn't look like Gropius at 75. Maybe I'm wrong. No, 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 it doesn't look like Gropius. But I like it more than Gropius. I mean, at least that Gropius in, in uh, the Athens embassy and some, some other works we saw. It's, it's more thrust, it's more vigorous, it's more virile in a good sense. And uh, I don't think it's him. It's also huge, as you can see. But I like the, the fact that this platform, you know, is elevated a little bit from the earth. And it's an interesting building. I, I was surprised when I discovered it. I never knew that this was, that Gropius had some participation here. And I'm still not sure what it consisted of or in. Of, I think, is correct. This is the last, his last major project from 1967-1969. So he was uh, almost uh, 82, 83 years old in Ohio. It's called a tower, but uh, you know, is it really a tower? It's a taller building, but uh, for the standards of the United States, I don't know if it qualifies for the, for the name tower. Now, if I compare this so-called tower with Price Tower by uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, we see two very different architects. I don't have here a picture with Price Tower, but maybe some of you uh, know it. Such a difference. You know, uh, to my sadness, Gropius is a little bit uh, conventional here. And, uh, you know, I'm looking for subtleties, but I don't really see them. It's, it's a building, it's a correct building, just like that embassy, but I expected more, to be honest. A surprise, it doesn't surprise me. So, uh, expanded with Gropius addition from 1970, so he was 83 years old. 
a little alteration to the original structure. Only American Art Museum to be brought to completion using a Gropius design. I'm confused because again, I, it's not very clear to me what he did here. Uh, I, I think it's it, it just an expansion, but uh, what exactly that expansion is, I imagine the part on the right, um, it's not, I don't know. I mean, this is the old museum, and then he added uh, what is hidden by the trees there. <laughs> Anyway, uh, yeah, this part on the right. Okay. Uh, there are many architectures kind of like this. It's, it doesn't seem to me uh, pioneering in any way, but... And from 97 and 1980, uh, well, in 1980, he didn't leave. This was built posthumously. Apparently the biggest, the largest holiday resort in Europe at that time in Greece, and maybe we, we should all uh, take the plane to there because I know I read that people uh, go to Greece now because they have less pandemic. So maybe we can go directly to Chokidiki at Porto Caras in Greece. And uh, it was built based on his designs, but we don't know to what extent his design was respected. It's big, all right. It's, you know, resort. Uh, architecture, resort hotel. Um, yeah, I, this is the last building that I show because it's the last that was built based on his designs to an extent, I believe only to an extent, after his death. He died in 1969, so this was built, you know, started four years after he died. That's it. I hope I didn't bore you too much. And I thank you that you participated. And now, uh, if you want, uh, we can talk a little bit. I even <laughs> attempted to put